Just to note, the CIO, in my case, stands for Chief Innovation Officer. Um, and I'm going to be looking at this <coughs> uh, learning analytics from a pragmatic perspective, informed by what the uh, 25 universities we're working closely with uh, at the moment, and a few, a few FE colleges as well, doing. So here's a brief outline of my talk, um, looking at more generally the evidence, what just we're doing, some of the practical issues around both descriptive and analytics and predictive models. So just to go off topic very briefly, we're obliged to say a little bit about the organisation JISC. We're a national charity supporting digital in higher education and further education in the UK. There's our vision uh, and our aim. Um, we've kind of got a wider aim to be the EdTech accelerator for the UK, so it's particularly good getting this <coughs> in Jordan, it's just off technology roundabout, which is closely associated with, with that kind of area. Just does three main things, provide national digital infrastructure, best known for the JANET network that connects every university, college and, and all of the publicly funded research laboratories, <coughs> the EduRome wireless network. We broker sector-wide deals on behalf of universities and colleges best known for GIST collections, through which universities subscribe to about half of their research journals. And we also provide expert uh, advice uh, to our members uh, in higher education, further education. Okay, that's enough about just now. We'll go straight back to answering the exam question and looking at learning analytics. So at a very high level, learning analytics is the application of big data techniques by educational establishments, establishments promoting learning <coughs> to help improve the way they deliver their goals. Of course, that depends on what the goals are, and they might be around retention, uh, success, achievement, employability, etc. In the diverse sector, um, it's very, it's right and proper. Different institutions do have different goals, and, and analytics is a powerful Why do we need this kind of thing? Well, the day after the uh, latest uh, longitudinal educational outcomes or LEO data have been provided, I think those numbers really speak for themselves about what people's prospects are and how markedly different they are in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and within universities there is an issue about non-continuation. Um, people who leave at the end of the first year of their degree um, that's obviously a personal tragedy for the, the individual involved. It's also a financial issue, students being £9,000 um, in debt at the end of that. And the most recent set of statistics published a couple of months ago by the Higher Education Statistics Agency showed that across the UK, the number of students um, dropping out at the end of their first year rose from 6 to 6.2%. And if you look at the lowest, um, what's called the, the, the polar three uh, lowest quintile, the areas of the UK that are least likely to send people, those figures, the decline was even worse. Um, so there's a real issue that this is <coughs> getting worse for everybody and it's particularly getting worse for what I might call non-traditional uh, students. So this is a real problem in all sorts of ways. More specifically, how does learning analytics work? Well, it uses exactly the same kind of technique that Amazon and Facebook and Google use. So you only have to visit Amazon's website half a dozen times, you might disclose information about yourself, your name, your address, so they know that, you've told them it explicitly, but they're also able to infer a great deal about you, your age, uh, how you vote, um, whether you've got children, where you, all sorts of things, what your tastes are. Um, in fact, it's quite frightening after how, how quickly they can build up a, um, uh, a, a picture about you. Similarly, Google and Facebook, you hand over some data to them quite ex explicitly, but they infer a heck of a lot about you. How do Facebook and Google make their money? It's actually by selling advertising, by selling highly targeted personalised advertising, because they know more about you than anyone else. They can charge a premium for their advertising <coughs> channels, particularly for politicians at elections, people who even want to peddle fake news, can target the people who can be most, they know will be most susceptible to it. So these are very powerful techniques using big data, data mining. They can be used for evil or they can be used for good. 
So as far as I'm concerned, learning analytics is, is, is a positive application of those same techniques. Um, <coughs> using the data that, that you um, <coughs> provide to your universities explicitly that ends up in the student record system, but also using the digital footprints, the digital exhaust, when students interact with VLEs, take books out of the library, attendance monitoring systems, all the patterns in that data, a bit like the patterns you leave when you visit Facebook site or, or, or Google sites. Um, the, the, the university can infer about how you're, what sort of learning you are, how you're doing, um, whether there's medium term changes or even very short term changes in, in that behaviour. So that's really how it works. Um, what's the evidence that it helps solve some of these problems? Um, much of the evidence in this area comes from United States, uh, who, along with Australia, probably the, the, the leading nations. The UK is a little bit behind them, but we're, we're hoping that that, that, that gap's going to be closed uh, very rapidly. Um, so, for example, Columbus State University College in Ohio, um, by using these learning analytics techniques, they managed to uh, increase their retention, students completing the, the end of their course, um, by 4.2 percent. So. 4.2% more, more students carried on and continued and completed their courses. Um, and when they looked at their non-traditional uh, cohorts, th th they found that the benefit of learning analytics was even higher. So the message, the message is from a lot of these quantitative studies that learning analytics can work for everybody in, in uh, helping them succeed in their studies. It works for everyone, but it works particularly well for uh, non-traditional cohorts. That is a pattern that's emerging. No one's actually proved what the explanation is, but people think it's something along the lines of maybe if you're the first person from your university, uh, from your family that's been to university, you come up against a university type problem. You haven't actually got anyone in your family you can turn to who's got experience of that kind of thing. So therefore, you're more likely to um, uh, uh, not be able to respond effective, as effectively as you might to it. Um, there's some evidence that different groups. Um, BME students, etc., maybe are less likely to seek help uh, when, when faced with a problem. That, um, th 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 there's various sort of cultural issues around seeking help. So again, something that proactively refers uh, people into counselling and advice services, which every university and college have. It's just that the, the, the way in which people are referred into it is sometimes a bit ad, ad hoc. So, so a more structured, data-driven way of doing that can, can make a particular difference to those non-traditional cohorts. But of course, it benefits everyone. So there is growing evidence that this really does work, um, and of course this turns into money. So um, it was in, if you read the Guardian yesterday, in the Guardian, uh, there's a piece about learning analytics in, in, in the United States. It's a shame they didn't write about the UK, a bit closer to home, but here we are. Um, and they noted that Georgia State University uh, saves three million dollars for every one percent improvement they make in their retention rate. Um, they invested about uh, one million dollars in their learning analytics service. So they, they, they but they, they delivered a financial return. So it's not just all of the good things about promoting success, particularly in non-traditional students, about avoiding those tragedies for individuals uh, who, who drop out, but the finance director should like this as well. So whichever way you look at it, it's good news. Here's a projection maybe for a uh, what would have been a member of the uh, 1994 group of universities in the UK, perhaps smaller research intensive university with a retention rate, maybe a first year non-completion rate, maybe about 5% at the moment, maybe by using that learning analytics they can improve that by a percent uh, to 4%. That can lead to, a, in terms of lost fees, if a student drops out at the end of the first year, that's two, second year, third year, maybe fourth year, nine grand a year. That's, um, well, you can do the maths, that's, that's tens of thousands of pounds lost per student. Um, so that can easily approach um, ten, five, maybe even 10 million pounds um, in, in terms of potential annual per annum in, in terms of lost fee income. And even for the very best of class universities that have got uh, retention rates about 1.5%, maybe they can only get a 0.1.2% improvement in that through learning analytics. We're still talking savings of of, of over a million pounds a year. So there's very clear ethical, um, moral, and, and uh, also financial reasons for, for, for doing this kind of thing. Okay. Now let's have a look at JISC's national service. Um, we have a large community. Um, so far we've got about 100 universities, 160 actively participating.
looks at 80 and about 20 further education colleges. We wish you had more FE colleges um, because this can work just as well for them, so that's something we're actively working on. We run regular quarterly events. We have a mailing list, um, a, a blog, etc. Please do get involved if, if you're not already. Um, one of the first things we did was around the law and ethics. Um, we did a review of um, ethical issues from a, from a global perspective, but also in relation to UK law. Um, perfectly legal thing to be doing. Uh, it's important that one gains the informed consent of students if one's using their data for a particular purpose. But let's remember, this is the, the data that's used in learning analytics. It's data that's already collected. I'm not aware of any case where the universities we're working with where they've collected any new data. But what's happened in the past, that data's just stayed in silos. Um, so uh, it's just been used for the internal administrative convenience of the university. And all learning analytics does is pull this data together in one place and start to use it to promote the success of the student, which isn't a new purpose. It's actually the core purpose of the institution. So uh, some universities have taken the view that they don't need any additional um, consent from students because actually it's data they're already collecting and the purpose they're using it for is absolutely the core purpose of the university. It's why the students are there in the first place. Of course, those final decisions are for the uh, individual universities themselves. Um, we've worked closely with the National Union of Students uh, who, are very, who recognize the power of learning analytics, the power for it to be used for good purposes and also for, for less good purposes. So their view is, They've written to every student union saying this is fine as long as it's being used to promote student success. So you should ask if your university or college is using this, you should find out and make sure and check that it's why it's being used, what it's being used for. But essentially, if it's being used to promote the success of students, then it's a good thing and we should, we should support it. Um, we've set up a national uh, framework, which from a technical point of view, we've got a national learning records warehouse. So we've got data from around 25 universities now flowing in to this uh, warehouse, uh, which, which is built in, in Amazon's cloud. We've got a set of um, uh, technical standards, so-called APIs, that allow all of the main uh, student record systems, VLEs, etc., um, to be fairly, library systems to be fairly easily plugged in to provide data into this warehouse. Um, we've also got a number of uh, products that plug into the top and we're working with leading vendors. It's important to know we're not trying to duplicate things that are already happening in the marketplace. We're working very closely with leading vendors, uh, getting them to plug their products into uh, our architecture. Um, benefit for universities is being part of a club, uh, avoiding being locked into particular products. But the benefit for vendors is actually a lower cost of sales <coughs> to innovation. Uh, so we're, we're actually uh, not trying to duplicate and make the market here and, and provide benefits for all parties. Um, each university or college has its own room in the warehouse. It's a room of two halves. There's a small data half of the room, which essentially contains the sort of data that you have in a student record system. Um, for universities, that data is structured in, according to the HESA data model. And we're very lucky in the UK that we have such a standard model. And then there's a big data half which is all, essentially all of the log files. This is where the digital exhaust lives. Um, uh, all of the, the, the traces that students leave in uh, log, log file traces in VLEs, library systems, etc., translated into a standard language called XAPI. And translating into a standard language is important because it allows us to, to actually compare across institutions potentially and do benchmarking. So some people are thinking, gosh, they can't, they can't, there's a lot of personal and sensitive data in here and it's being stored in the cloud. Is all of that legal and ethical? We're pretty sure it is. But actually, there's another organisation that, that's proved this for us, and that's UCAS. So up to about four years ago, uh, UCAS's systems used to regularly fall over on A-level results data. People who worked in the sector were involved in student record systems remember this well. The only way they could solve this problem was by moving their, uh, the front of their, of their admission systems into Amazon's cloud, which they did about four years ago. So just for that crazy week every year when the A-level results come out, in fact, mostly it's, it's, the, it's the very day that they Clearing really kicks in. They have an enormous spike in traffic, and the only way they can cater for that is by use of the cloud. And in fact, it's one of the best use cases for uh, public cloud in, in, in that way. So, hats off to UCAS. They solved all of those uh, policy issues and proved that that kind of data can, uh, can you know, they're a risk averse organisation. They wouldn't have done this unless, um, unless they were absolutely sure. And, and so, so are we that it's an appropriate way to do. 
Here's a set of the partners um, that we're working with in terms of uh, plugging products both into the bottom of the warehouse's sources of data and into the top of the warehouse providing um, dashboards, etc. Um, and here's a, a very brief recipe of how you can start to get involved <coughs> in GISC work if you're one of the 60 universities, for example, that's not. Uh, we've got some good online advice and there's, there's further consultancy available. So please uh, do follow those links and, and join in if you want to. Okay, so let's have a look at how some of this works fr fr from the bottom up level. We've got a very simple tool that our universities are using um, when they first get their data into the warehouse, just to visualize it, just to make sure that it all lines up. This is before anybody comes near running any plan like that. And here's a really interesting view that universities, and pretty well every university we've worked with has found this. What we do is we encourage, it's act, I'm trying to do this from a pragmatic perspective, and it's like, there's an old saying that um, it's not the technology that causes problems, it's the processes. And it, that applies pretty well to every uh, tech IT project I've ever been involved in. It, it, it works here. So what are the process-related issues? Well, actually, there's one around management of assessment. And when you hear it, you kind of think, well, yeah, it's obvious, but why didn't people think of that? So what... It's not rocket science, really. When you think, what are the main el predictive elements? What are the, what, what are the fingerprints, the, the footprints that you leave, which are most indicative of how successful they are? Uh, if, if, if you're trying to predict what their final marks are going to be in the exam, Hey presto, one of the best indicators is their marks in mid-module assessments. You kind of expect that, wouldn't you? It's not a total shock. And it, it's sure enough the data proves that. So how can we capture those mid-module uh, summative assessment marks and, and make sure that we've got really good in real-time indications of how students are doing so we can intervene if needed and um, improve their chances of success? Well, actually, from all the universities that we've come across so far, so we can say this without picking on anybody, um, not very easily. Because if you look at when these, this tool requires you to uh, say when all of these assessment, module assessments are due to be handed in, and if you look at that, there's a huge spike right in the middle of the, so this is for a degree program. So this is a set of modules looking for a typical student, uh, and hey presto, all of, all of the modules have a mid-module assessment that's due in at the same time. So all of the stress for the student is piled up in the middle of the module, and in terms of providing, you know, you could space this out more easily, but, but the ability to, to get um, more real-time tracking of progress is lost. What happens to those marks once they're there? Yeah. Um, actually, they don't even go on for, so they typically live in a spreadsheet until the week before the end of the module when they're quickly uploaded onto the student record system um, and uh, therefore any potential use in the middle of the module is lost. So as soon as you put this in front of students, they'll say, hang on a minute, is this, whose who's convenience is this being, is this for your, this is for your convenience, isn't it? This isn't, for, this isn't organized for my benefit. And actually all the universities working now start looking at how can we, A, be much clearer about when these, uh, spacing out these assessments, and B, how can we make sure the marks, as soon as the work's marked, that those marks end up on the system, even in an unmoderated form, they can come up with prediction. So that's one of the first, before you get anywhere near a clever piece of artificial intelligence, one of the early lessons is you need to sort out particularly your mid-module assessments um, and, and a number of universities are really working on that. And the nice, the good thing is it's quite an easy problem to solve once you focus on it. Um, there's more general work then, so that's a very simple example of uh, improving the curriculum, improving the structure of assessment, but one can improve other aspects of the blended curriculum. And there's a chap called Park Rientes in the Open University who's doing some more general work about how you can use data to improve the, the, the structure of the blended curriculum. Um, we have a, a, an app, I'm not going to say too much about it, it's a bit like Fitbit, it uses more of a merge technology. It doesn't create a predictive model of your final grade because if you woke up every morning and you had a message that says, ha, you're still going to fail, <laughs> <laughs> it would kind of become self-fulfilling. So this is about encouraging a more sort of gamified approach, setting targets and comparing with your mates. Uh, here's an example of a tribal insights dashboard. This is one of the commercial companies we're working with. This is a sort of information that a personal tutor might uh, look at just before they go into their tutorial with maybe eight, eight, ten students, advising them across a series of models on, you know, maybe you need to work on your essay writing skills, you've got a particular problem here. Just providing simple information to the tutor so it's really worth their while. They know that if they go into this ten minutes before the tutorial, that tutorial will be ten times better. They'll be able to really focus on Here's a slightly different tool which is dealing with short-term problems. This is from 
uh, the Marist suite in the States, a student whose behaviour suddenly changes, maybe they've come across an experience, they've gone off the rails in some way, um, very quick intervention from the existing pastoral care services, etc., uh, can make a real difference. So again, the second pragmatic thing, aside from looking at um, assessment patterns, a bit more new assessment patterns, the university is looking at real clarity over the role of teachers. Is it just in providing academic advice? Is it acting as a social worker? Should it be the counselling service or something similar that, that picks up these very short-term alerts and deals with them? The actual responses that are made to, to these alerts are the ones that are already there. Every university we've dealt with has a personal teacher system, has a pastoral system, has a counselling service, has a mental health, has a student uh, health function. It's just that the way that people refer into that is somewhat ad hoc. There isn't really data on how effective that is. This allows, like, like, like the example we saw um, uh, from, from Georgia Tech University, that they, they spend, what was the data, they spend 30,000 hours a week following up with those individual students on the basis of learning analytics alerts. Um, and that's part of how they've done it. So very briefly to finish off, in the short term, those are the sorts of benefits you can get from learning analytics, especially when you solve some of these practical problems around the role of the teacher in assessments. Uh, in the medium term, we are creative and long term. We are creating a globally unique source of data. No other country has all this learning analytics data in one place. It'll let us do benchmarking. Nobody's around learning analytics. Nobody's done this before because no other country has this data in one place. If you say, huh, no, this can't be done, no one else has done it. Well, that's the reason why. No one's been in a position to start. We can use the hefty learning game data. Some of those cohorts are also in our systems. We can use those to calibrate new models potentially for, uh, so we may be able to, if we can, if we can make it work. Calibration works with the found new digital methods of, of gauging learning gain and also the ability to cross reference this against some of the LEO data that published yes, uh, yesterday uh, will allow the UK to do some really quite interesting work using some proper big data to do some fundamental research into how education works. There are sessions later today about the future of uh, how this will lead. So we're trying very hard at the moment. This is what we call the Davis model in GISC. This is part of our uh, TAL strategy. We're working very hard to get everybody in the UK to first base at the moment around VLEs. And this is how we see things panning out in the future towards this kind of artificial intelligence view. And I know my colleague Martin Hamilton is uh, speaking on this later this afternoon. There's also a panel session. So, to summarise, learning analytics is a powerful technique, um, proven in the States, works for everyone, particularly for non traditional cohorts. Through just scheme, we're providing safety in numbers in the UK, we're making it attractive for vendors, um, and we're helping lead the sector on this journey towards AI. Please get involved. Thank you. <coughs>